one of the most popular movie or books in the Christian realm has to be the series known as Left Behind. And in fact, a new Left Behind is now out starring none other than Kevin so Sorbo. Yes, old Hercules is out and now he is a part of the new Left Behind maybe series, but at least the movie that is out. And so what we wanna talk about on this live special episode is whether or not the movie Left Behind actually leads you astray. So with me today to discuss this very, very important topic is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Important topic, Chad, very important. In fact, some of the questions that have come up that you've refreshed me on, realize, man, makes you realize how important this question is. Uh, man, uh, yeah, the movie dropped today. In fact, you and I wanted to go see it before this show, but it's actually going to be airing, I think, the same time we're probably talking or just a little bit later. Yep. But yeah, very, very important topic. But we praise God that so much of our audience uh, uh, were pre-trib until they saw my debate with Stoffer, Doug's Dr. Dove Stoffer over in Colorado, Twin Peaks, hosted by, uh, you know, a, a big Prophecy in the Prophecy News. In yeah. the news. And, and many others have seen our expose called Left Behind or Led Astray. We traveled around the world to film that and, and show the history of the pre-trib rapture. So we praise God that so many of you have been rescued from that viewpoint that teaches that you don't really need to be ready for the Great Tribulation period, even though Jesus said, you know, that many will fall away at that time because they're not prepared. And what pre-tribulationism does, it leaves the church ill-equipped to face the Antichrist in the coming tribulations. And I think it's so important that we understand what Jesus said about the future because the early church, Chad, in before 70 AD, they were reading what Jesus said in Matthew 24 that when Jerusalem is encircled by the armies to flee, and they fled. And those who didn't flee would have been killed. But they were paying attention to what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, yet we're being told now, oh, well, you know, 1,800 years after Jesus said those words in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, well, really those words aren't for the church. We've got this new light. And now the church is ill-prepared for what Jesus called the greatest tribulation that will ever be. It's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, concerning Christ's coming, concerning his coming, an hour being gathered together to him, which everybody agrees is the rapture, is the catching up. He says, concerning Christ's coming, an hour being gathered together to him. He says, let no one deceive you by any means. And in verse 2, he gives the various means, a word as from us, or a prophecy, or, or, or a daemon, a diamond, or, or I'm sorry, a demon, or, or you know, word as from us, or and what have you, or a letter as from us as well. He gives three different warnings there. But he says, Concerning Christ coming, are being gathered together to him. Listen to this. It's very clear. I love you if you're pre-trib, but listen, just accept the clear teaching of Scripture. Concerning Christ coming, are being gathered together to him. The rapture, verse 1. Verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, i.e. what he just says in verse 2. For that day, the rapture, Christ coming to gather us, will not come until there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposed himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And then in verse 8, it says that the lawless one will be revealed, the Antichrist, whom the Lord, that's speaking of Jesus, will come and destroy with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his parousia. In fact, in verse 1, when it says concerning Christ's coming, the Greek word is parousia, and are being gathered together to him. Then you see the parousia later. The Antichrist is revealed. Then Christ destroys him with the with the, uh, the spirit of his mouth, the brightness of his coming. It's so clear. Again, concerning Christ's coming, I'll be gathered together to him, verse 1. Verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you. That day will not come, lest it come a fallen away first than the Antichrist. And Chad, he warns about being deceived by a demon spirit even there. Why? Because Satan would love us to get our eschatology all messed up so we ignore what Jesus said about the future in Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21. So we ignore what Paul warned about regarding the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2. So we ignore what John said in 1 John 2, 18. You've heard that Antichrist is coming, the Antichrist. Christ, right? Even now, many are in the world. Or so you'd ignore the book of Revelation, which warns all about the coming Antichrist and how believers have to persevere during that time. This is of grave concern because Jesus spent so much time warning the church about it. And now all these warnings were told, uh, we're reading somebody else's mail. This is actually for people. He spent all this time warning people that would be alive after the rapture. That's just, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous. It's unscriptural. No, amen. But with all of that, I say that as to this is somebody saying, hey, I'm open to whatever. What scriptures do you got? And so, Joe, that's what I'm handing off to you. What scriptures yeah. do you got? You know, uh, and just off the heart, off the top of the head, because it's everywhere in the and scripture. And by, by the way, you don't see any notes here. 
This is just no, your heart because it's a subject you care about. I, no, I just yeah, want to point and that out. Well, and, and, the, and the subjects that are tied to this, I, I think, are a lot of these things live in our hearts because they're very important issues. Uh, but what I would say, Chad, in answer to that question is uh, the, the second coming was always not only the historical view of the church and the early church fathers, the, the, ap the apostolic fathers believed in a, a singular second coming, you know, uh, whether it was, you know, Ignatius or Polycarp or what have you. But then when you look at the church fathers and you look at Irenaeus and Justin Martyr and Hippolytus and Tertullian and these guys, they're all post-trib, you know. In fact, a lot of pre-trib leaders admit that the early church were classical pre-millennial post-tribulationists. I mean, they believed in a literal thousand-year reign, but Christ would come before the thousand years, but not until after the tribulation, then the thousand years would come. Uh, but looking at Jesus' teachings, in, in John chapter 6, verse 39, Jesus said something very important. He talks about, you know, that's the will of the Father, that of all that the Father has given Jesus, he says that he would lose nothing, but that he would raise it up at the last day. So it's the will of the Father that those that would be raised, the dead in Christ, right, would, would be raised on the last day. Everything that, everyone that belongs to Jesus, that's all of us, right, that belong to him. But those who die would be raised on the last day. Pre-trib teaches that in the last days, well, we're going to be taken out seven years before the last day. But this is the important thing is Jesus said on the last day the resurrection would take place. And it's important to understand this because in John 6 through 9, when he says that well, the dead will be raised that are in Christ, those that belong to him in the last day, when does a rapture happen in respect to the last day? Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the dead in Christ will rise first. So the dead in Christ that rise in the last day, they'll rise first. And then we who believe and remain until that day or survive as that work be translated will be caught up to meet them in the air. So the rapture happens right after, uh, probably a split second or so, after the resurrection of the dead. So there's no way if the dead are being raised that are in Christ on the last day. And the rapture is right after that, Paul says, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, that you can have a rapture seven years before the last day. So pre-trips can't come up with a verse that says we'll be raptured seven years before the last day. But we have very clear scripture that the resurrection of those who are in Christ takes place on the last day. And Chad, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus dealt with, uh, he gave a parable to uh, mention, you know, basically teach that uh, tares and wheat would grow together, right, in the world. The field is the world, so the tares and wheat would grow together. And uh, he talks about the farmer and people sowing, you know, a, a wicked person sowing tares among the wheat. And then uh, somebody came, you know, they, they, his servant said, Lord, you know, to their master, do you want us to divide these up, you know, and take out all the tares early, you know, just just divide them? And he said, no, wait till they grow together until the harvest. And then Jesus basically told us what that meant was that the wheat and the tares, the believers with the non-believers, will grow together. And then Jesus said that the angels will separate them at the end of the age, not seven years before the end of the age, but they would grow together until the end of the age. And we know that, that, that there's no wheat being harvested before the end of the age, because guess what? In Matthew 24, Jesus' longest message he ever gave while earth on earth before his crucifixion and resurrection is the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21, Mark 13. You put those scriptures together, it's even longer than the Sermon on the Mount because he wanted the church to be ready. And that was just days before he was, a couple days before he was crucified to warn us of what would be going on there. So it's imperative that we understand Jesus was asked, you know, when will these things be, meaning the destruction of the temple? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now keep in mind, the harvest of the wheat doesn't happen until the end of the age. And then he brings them through the, the years, the time period, the tribulation period that precedes the very end of the age. And there nowhere, nowhere does he tell them that there's a rapture for them. He tells his apostle with a personal pronoun, pronoun you. When you see these things, these tribulation events, the personal plural pronoun, Peter, James, John, Andrew, the apostles of the early church. And Jesus had already introduced that they would be leading the church in Matthew chapter 18, talked about bringing a wicked person that refused to repent before the church, right? And a couple chapters before that, chapter 16, verse 18, uh, Peter says, you know, Jesus said to Peter, upon this rock, speaking of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, upon Jesus, uh, I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So they understood that they were going to be leading the church as apostles. He tells them, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you, 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 then he brings them to the end of the tribulation. But guess what he says? When these tribulation needs, birth pains take place, the end is not yet. That's not the end of the age. Pre-tribbers think, oh, there's a rapture right there when the tribulation starts. He says, the end's not yet. Don't be alarmed. You're going to go through these things, he tells them. He tells them not to fall away because many will fall away. He says, he that endures the end will be saved. 
And Thomas, that's one reason, not to get to the next two question too, too fast, but that's one reason this is important, because many are going to fall away because they're not ready to suffer through this, and only those who endure to the end will be saved, verse 13. But then in verse 14, Chad, he's saying this, he says this to him, then the, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, as it was to all the nations, then the end will come. So it's through the tribulation period that we finish up or we seek to finish the Great Commission because guess what? That harvest of the wheat and the tares is not ripe. That harvest is not ripe until the end of the age. And then we get to the end of the age, verses 29 through 31. Jesus says immediately after the tribulation, after the tribulation, not before, not in the middle, but after the tribulation, not three quarters of the way through. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark, and the moon will not give its light, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. They shall see the Son of the Man come in the clouds of heaven with great glory. There will be the sound of this trumpet, right? And by the way, when Paul says we'll be raised, somebody you read there said, well, deal with it. Paul said it's a mystery. Well, yeah, Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed in the, in the twinkle of eye at the last trumpet. Well, guess what? There's no trumpets before that that would qualify the rapture because that's, they wouldn't be the last trumpet. And this last trumpet happens, Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation. Pre-tribs want the last day to be seven years, want there to be a rapture seven years before the last day. Jesus said, nah, uh They want there to be a, a, a rapture seven years before the last trumpet. Nah, uh There it is in chapter 29, or chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. And by the way, when Paul said, and, and I'll get back to what Jesus is talking about there, when he says, behold, I tell you a mystery, shall I sleep? And he talks about the rapture being at the last day, guess what? He says, then, he says, the scripture will be fulfilled. He quotes a couple of scriptures, and one that he quotes is right from the Old Testament in the, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 25, 26, which we call the mini-apocalypse, where Isaiah has the people of God going through the tribulation period, right? And then at the end of the tribulation, death is swallowed up in victory at the resurrection. And Isaiah scholars admit and follows, yeah, this is at the end of the tribulation period. Well, guess what? Paul quotes that scripture from Isaiah about the end of the tribulation. It says that's when the last trumpet's going to blow. That's at the end of the tribulation. Just, just you know, look at the, do intertextual study. You'll see what he's talking about there. But by the way, Paul says at the last trumpet, chapter 29, chapter 24, verse 29, 31, the trumpet blows. There couldn't have been, that. Can't, there can't be a last trumpet before that or, that, or that wouldn't be the last trumpet. There wouldn't be another trumpet blowing. But that trumpet blows, that's the last trumpet, Chad. And this is what's amazing about this, is the gospel will continue to get preached. That harvest will not take place, as Jesus said, and the separation of the wheat and tares will not take place until the end of the age. But Jesus says, when they ask about the end of the age, when it will be, he, keeps, he says, the end is not yet. And then the end of the age comes immediately after the tribulation. And that's when Jesus says he'll gather his elect from the four winds of heaven. In, math, in Mark 13, it says from the farthest ends of the earth and the farthest ends of the heaven. Because the dead in Christ rise first, right? So the dead are going to be rising farthest ends of the earth, even deep under the ground, man. They'll be raised first. And in the farthest ends of heaven, because all the saints that are in heaven that have been there, been to go be with the Lord, they'll be raptured. We'll all be brought together in Christ. And what's amazing about this, Paul, or what's amazing about this, Frank, Chad? <laughs> what's amazing about this, Chad? Is Paul that is very, a pretty good compliment. Yeah, we'll I'll go to Paul next. That's why he's on <laughs> my brain. But what's amazing about this, when you go to the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says this to his disciples, the apostles of the early church. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. There's a the harvest again, right? Uh, uh, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And, and, and he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, lo, I'm with you even to the end of the age. Not seven years before the end of the age, but he's with the apostles and the disciples and their disciples until he comes. No one would know the day and the hour. Until the end of the age, not rapture seven years before the end of the age. So Thomas, this is very clear teaching. This is what the church had always believed. And, and when you look at Paul's teachings, we just looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 54 or so. But if you look at Paul's teaching in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, when we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, the rapture, he goes on to say, but that day, we're not in darkness, that that day should overtake us like a thief. Now, this is interesting. When Jesus, when, where did Paul get this language? He uses the same language. I have 80 parallels, over 80 parallels. Tony helped me put together a chart. I gave him these parallels between Jesus' teaching in, the, in, all of, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and, and Paul's teachings in First and Second Thessalonians. Paul uses the same language, a lot of the same Greek words. He uses the same expressions that Jesus uses because he's talking about the same rapture, the same second coming. And Paul says, he uses a thief coming. Well, guess what? That's what Jesus said. But Jesus used the coming of Jesus, or Jesus spoke of himself as coming like a thief right after he says he's coming immediately after the tribulation. 
Then he goes on to say he's coming like a thief, meaning, guess what? Now you may be ready, but you're going to be destroyed because if the man of the house, the wise man of the house knew he was coming when he was, the thief was coming, he would have boarded up his house. I mean, we've got to be ready because guess what? It's not a secret rapture. It's a rapture, but also destruction for the wicked. And that's why Paul says, right after he mentions being caught up to meet him in the air, that's why Paul says, Chad, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, my pre-trib brothers, I love you guys so much. Just want you to understand this. That's why Paul says that the world will be saying peace and safety. But sudden destruction will come upon them like a thief, right? Well, wait a minute. The preacher of rapture is supposed to be no destruction. It's supposed to be caught up in the air. And then we whisk, whisk away and have a big party where our brothers and sisters are being slaughtered on the earth for seven years. That's not what the Bible teaches. It says, when that day comes, Paul says, we're not in darkness that that day should overtake us like a thief because we're children of light. And then he warns them to remain children of light by not getting drunk with the drunkards and so forth and being alert and being watchful, meaning live a life for Jesus. So it's interesting, Chad, when he talks about the rapture, he talks about it coming like a thief. And he talks about the wicked being destroyed because it's not seven years earlier. It's at the end of the age. And then I think the most important text, because it's so clear, is Second Thessalonians 1 and 2. And I'll just handle them briefly because oh, yeah, I started off with favorite. them. Yeah, they're, they're, and Chad just said they're his favorite because in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, Chad, uh, you know, he says in verses 6, 7, 8, and so, and then even following, he, they're being persecuted. This is to the church. No one can deny he's talking to the church. And he says, rest from us from your persecutions. You're going to get rest. But you know what? He doesn't say you're going to get rest seven years before the end of the age, seven years before the last trumpet, seven years before, uh, you know, the, the last day, or seven years before the Lord comes back in his second coming with his mighty angels to destroy the wicked, which is what pre-trips teaches seven years earlier. He says, rest with us. When it's a time text, tells us exactly when the rapture is, as far as not day and the hour, but in juxtaposition to the tribulation and the second coming. He says, rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven. This is when the church gets its rest. When he's revealed from heaven, not a secret rapture, but he says, with his mighty angels in flaming fire to take vengeance on the wicked and all those that do not know God and all those that do not obey the Lord Jesus Christ on the day that he comes to be admired in his saints. So Paul very clearly, see, pre-tribs don't have a verse. They're a eschatological construct in search of just one verse. And they're bereft of one verse or passage. Yet Paul clearly says the church gets its rest when Jesus comes with his mighty angels of flaming fire to destroy the wicked on that same day. We're going to admire him when he comes and gives us rest from tribulation. That's the context there. And then he says just a few verses later, no real chapter breaks in the original letter. That's when he says concerning Christ's coming, our being gathered together to him the rapture. So don't let anyone deceive you by any means. That day's not going to happen until the falling away happens first and the man of sin and of Christ is revealed. Now, that's the crazy thing. That's the same exact order Jesus gave Matthew 24. And if you've missed everything I said, because I know I get a lot in quick and you can just listen twice or listen to it on, on three-quarter speed or half speed and because I know I speak too fast sometimes, but I like to get a lot of truth in, man. So I want you to understand this. In Matthew 24, you know what Jesus gave regarding the events? There would be this great falling away, he said. Then there'd be an abomination of desolation. Then Christ coming to gather us after the tribulation period. And you know what? Tim LaHaye calls that the second installment of the rapture. He admits it's a rapture. The thing is, he can't find the first installment of the rapture anywhere. He has a chart of Matthew 24, and he puts between right before the falling away, he says, you got a little arrow, there's the rapture. But there's no verse that says it. He, just, it, he wants us to assume that, okay? So this is a crazy thing that you need to understand. As Paul says, concerning Christ coming, gathered together to him, that's going to happen when... Jesus, the Antich after the Antichrist, following the way it happens in the Antichrist, same order Jesus gave, falling away, Antichrist, he comes and gathers us together. By the way, the Greek word that Jesus used right there to gather us in verse is 29 through 31 is uh, episonago, and that's a, a, a verb. And Paul uses the same word in the noun form concerning Christ coming, our episonagoge, which we get the word synagogue from, gathering. He uses the same language Jesus does, gives the same order, uh, falling away, Antichrist, Christ coming to gather the saints. And he says, don't be deceived about it. Jesus also said, don't be deceived about secret pre-trib comings or premature comings when they say I'm in the secret place. And by the way, Chad, just and I'll just do this in a minute. The church is, has the book Revelation addressed to them. And guess what? You see the same order. You see the church warned about uh, the need to persevere at that time so they don't fall away. You see the revelation of the Antichrist. 
and he makes war on the saints. And then you see the church ready, but not yet raptured in chapter 19. When people say, where's the church in Revelation? It's all over the place, man. Who's that great multitude that no man can number? Revelation 7, from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue that may cleanse by the blood of the Lamb, but the church. That's a great description of the church. But guess what? Chapter 19 is a really clear description too. It says his bride has made herself ready. That's at the end of the tribulation. She's finally ready. Verses 9, chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. And then in verse 11, after the tribulation, there it is. Jesus coming back on his white horse, right, with armies from heaven. And guess what? That's when the bride receives their Messiah. So the order is very clear. It's very clear in Scripture. We just need to accept what the Scriptures teach. But it's not just clear, Chad. We're actually warned against a premature coming that would keep us ill-equipped to face the coming tribulation period in the Antichrist. And that's why it burns an art that people would know. And, and you may disagree with us, but you're going to have to say, hey, they're definitely sincere in their beliefs, and I need to listen to at least their arguments. <laughs> yeah, I think that's an important thing, is that you know that we have specific scriptures that we go to, and then, you know, the, the next thing we're going to do, and I would say this, this is somebody, Chuck Rothless, I think it's Roethlisberger, not spelled the same way as the quarterback, but uh, but... You know, we had a discussion on there, and I said, hey, man, if you could give a scripture that, that clearly teaches that the rapture takes place seven years prior to the tribulation, not something that's vague or in this picture, hey, in the book of Job, it talks about them hiding here and so forth, and, you know, oh, well, this one here. I said, if you've got any scripture, and uh, he didn't give any specific scripture, but then I asked him if this is his point, and he said it was, and so here was what he said. So I thought it'd be good, and I know Job... We're already running low on time, uh, as always. So I, instead of putting both this one and the one of why it matters, we're going to accompany these two together. But okay. I want to read his argument because one of the things we wanted to do, because what takes place, and you you hear this from pre-tribbers, and it happens, in, and I'm not trying to you know say you're like Muslims, but Muslims do this too in the sense that they will say things like, oh, you're always having to defend the Trinity. And that's all you're always doing is coming against, uh, you know, this, 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 that, and the other of our arg arguments. But you're never putting anything positive out. So for the last 30 minutes, you've just been putting the positive case for Did I think 30 the post trip. Minutes? Wow. <laughs> well, we only got like 15 oh, minutes wow, left. So I'm well, thinking it was about that. I could go for like 30 hours. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> subject if you guys want me to. And you did all of so book Revelation scriptures. in one hour, and you also did it over the course of seven years, multiple times. So we could do that. But I thought this one can be answered pretty easily, actually. And one of the things he said, you actually touched on without, you've never seen this question, uh, and but he did mention something, <coughs> excuse me, that you had mentioned just now with the book Revelation, because I found it interesting. And here's what he, he said. He said, when I asked him that question, well, offhand, it would be that we are not destined unto wrath. The seven-year tribulation is literally the wrath of the Lamb. I did ask him regarding that part. I'm going to read the rest of the comment, but I did ask him regarding that, that part. I quoted First Thessalonians to him, and I said, are you saying that what this is saying, that we are not appointed to wrath, that God could not pour out his wrath there on the earth without hitting the believers. Are you, is that what you're the case that you're making? Um, and he did affirm that. So then we keep going. And he said, the harpazo, or catching away in the clouds, is also different than Christ returning and literally touching down on earth. Now, this is the argument that when he comes in the clouds, uh, basically, that's not really coming to earth because he's only on the clouds. Uh, that's kind of the argument, not a very good one. But either way, it, it makes way more sense we're removed prior to his wrath, not to mention the plea, the complete, and this is what I talked about. You, you said it without even knowing this question was coming. The complete lack of direction for the church during that seven years, huh. which... We just talked about all the directions. And by the way, the hyper-dispensationalist would argue that a lot of those letters where we're seeing all the perseverance stuff is actually not for us, but for the church one day that's going to be there during, sorry, I shouldn't say church for their purposes, but the tribulation, tribulation saints, saints so, called. so many letters, and that's Doug, Doug, Doug Stoffer's view, so many of those letters that we read in our Sunday services to push forth love and good deeds from the pastoral ministry to the congregation. So many of those are actually for the tribulation saints and not us. So already there's some convolution there. Mm -hmm. But then he says, because they're removed in chapter four, when the door is open, love you guys. Oh, just what does my it say removed? I love how they add, do not, brother, I love you, man. Do not add to the scripture. It never says they're removed in chapter four. Where does it say that in the text? 
Nowhere. That that's exactly that's what I wanted to get to. Exegesis getting out of the text. What it says. Exegesis is reading your view into the text. Don't do that. It's dangerous because the book of Revelation warns not to add to the book. It's dangerous. Read Revelation or take away eighteen or nineteen. Or take, take away, away the church when that's not actually taking place. Yeah. And and Joe, I want to hand off the the main two poor points that I thought. And you got less than ten there's minutes. A, there's to a do few it. things there. So yeah, there's we'll a few things it. there. But the the main the main two points is the idea that that the wrath is being poured out. Therefore, the church is not appointed to wrath. Therefore, the church cannot be here. Now, that's an argument from silence, just as much as the church isn't there after chapter 3. Chapter 4, come up hither, and all of a sudden the church isn't there because, I don't know, when there's seven letters written to seven churches in a horseshoe. Okay, now, you've just given two propositions. Two propositions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll answer those two, and then we'll go what to what, some, some other things there, too, yeah. that we want to parse out, because I want to be uh, diligent to yes, answer whatever yes. he says. But the idea... That uh, the church isn't there. I'll go with that first because that I just revelation. That revelation. revelation. Yes. First of all, revelation is addressed to the church. Revelation chapter one, verse one through three says, you know, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things must shortly come to pass. And he sent signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse three, blesses he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. Keep that in mind. Keep those things that are written therein. And then verse 4, he says, None of the seven churches which are in Asia. It's addressed to the churches and not just those seven because at the end of each church, it says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. The churches, so those are models of what he's saying to churches that are in whatever shape those churches are in. We're all supposed to have ears to hear. And then in chapter 22, when Jesus signs off, he says, that I testify of these things in the churches. It's not addressed to non-believing Jews or the 144,000 specifically, as our pre-trib friends would say. It's addressed to the church. And uh, and to say that the church is, you know, gone, I just mentioned Revelation 7, the verses are 9 through 14, where Jesus talks about, addresses the tribu- those who are in the tribulation, and they're from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue, and they've been cleansed, it says, by the blood of the Lamb. If I said to you, brothers and sisters today, identify this group, and I talked about those guys that drive around in black and whites and have lights on their cars and so forth, you'd say, <coughs> uh, police officers, I'd say, yeah, that's what I was thinking. If I said, who does this identify on the earth today? People from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue that have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, you would say the church. So why would he get to Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 14 and say, that's not the church though? You'd only say that based on a presupposition of presupposing there was a rapture of which, no, you can't find a specific verse. And by the way, I got quotes from Thomas Ice, John Walford, uh, uh, Mayhew, the top pre-trib teachers, admitting there's not a clear verse that teaches the pre-trib rapture. So why are we teaching it? Especially when so much is at stake, brothers and sisters. So we see the church, and I just mentioned in Revelation chapter 19, uh, Jesus, when he comes back, just before he comes back, his bride is on the earth, and it says she has been made ready for, for, the, for his coming. And it says she's to be clothed in white garments, which is righteous acts of the saints. So the bride is equivocated or put with, it's, it's the same as the saints. In the Revelation 13, 5, the beast makes war on the saints. They're identified as the bride in chapter 19. In fact, in chapter 12, at the end of 12, and also in other places, uh, Satan goes after those who keep the commandments of God and bear the testimony of Jesus, man. That's who the Lord is coming for. So it's definitely addressed to the church. In fact, it was only under, I, I love you guys, but it's only understood that way for the first 1,800 years of church history. You guys are the ones bringing in the new doctrine and causing division. We have to respond to it. Was Paul causing division when he corrected the false belief that Christ would come before the Antichrist to rapture the church when he said, don't be deceived? That day won't happen until the Antichrist comes first, the falling away in the Antichrist? No. He was speaking truth because our unity is supposed to be based on the truth not on lies so the first point is yes indeed the book of revelation addresses the church very clearly you can't show where it doesn't and number two as far as they're the being saved from the wrath of god i'll tell you what we're having this show because the new left behind movie is out right now and we didn't get a chance to see it but i know where they're at as far as the book series goes and right now you know what the rapture has already happened unless they redid the preacher rapture in the movie they could have but guess what the left behind series is a lot about after the supposed pre-trib rapture, it's about Christian believers during the tribulation period. And guess what they're shown doing? They're showing being spared the wrath of God. Did you hear what I just said? Pre-trib leaders teach that the Christians that are there during the tribulation period will be spared the wrath of God. Okay? Tim LaHaye's study Bible, top pre-trib teacher in the last 15 years, along with Thomas Ice, they started together the pre-trib research center. In his study Bible, in the book of Isaiah, when it says to God's people to go in to your homes specifically until the indignation is passed. It says in the little note there, this is one of the ways that God will spare the tribulation saints during the tribulation from the wrath of God. 
They only use, oh man, you want to escape God's wrath, so you have to be raptured when they're trying to get you to believe the preacher of rapture. But when they recognize the people are there, they recognize that God protects his people. And guess what? I don't need to go based on what they're saying. I go based on what the scriptures say because I see that everybody that takes the mark of the beast, a grievous sore appears in their hands. Not on the uh, the believers who don't take the mark of the beast. I see that the wrath is selective and specifically over and over again. In Revelation, it shows it's targeted at the, the unbelievers. In fact, God tells believers, come out of Babylon, come out of her, my people, lest you partake of her sins and her plagues. Now, if you rebel against God during the tribulation period, you say, no, I'm going to stay right here. Well, then you're going to partake of his wrath, but that's because you're a rebel at that point. You're not obeying Jesus. You're not trusting and following the Lord. But for the Christians that follow the Lord, we are not appointed to wrath. I would also like to say that most of the wrath is associated for the very end of the tribulation, which is at the sixth seal, seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl. And by the way, the seventh trumpet is the last of the seven trumpets. That's when Paul said the rapture would take place. And that's a picture of the very end when it says in Revelation chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, you know, that there will be delay no longer for God's judgment. And it says in the voice of the seventh angel, that's that seventh trumpet, the mystery of God will be finished. That was spoken to his prophets, his service of prophets, as in the apostle Paul. Well, guess what happens when you get to the seventh trumpet, verses 15 through 19 of chapter 11. The seventh trumpet blows, and guess what? Jesus Christ returns. His wrath comes the same day his saints are rewarded because that's the second coming. He says, when I come, my reward is with me. Revelation chapter 22. It all fits together like a hand in the glove. fits together so perfectly. Jesus is coming back. We're not appointed to wrath. And yes, the book of Revelation is addressed to believers. No, amen. And I wanted to get this in before I get into, and, and I'm gonna and I'm accompany this uh, with the last one. And if you guys heard, we have a little bit of uh, some coughing. Josh did while the camera's on you throw me a cough drop, but you didn't get one. But I also want to let you get all that out before I cough. So I can Amen. Too fast. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I want to let you guys know too, and this is one of the last chances we can do this because next week, and I, we want to update just a couple people, and we were a little late, so we can go maybe a minute over. So, but I want to let you guys know uh, next week, I think it's next week, yeah, we'll actually be on the East Coast for the East Coast Men's Retreat. And a lot of the Good Fight team is going. We're leaving Tommy behind, not because uh, he, we were supposed to or anything. We <laughs> wanted him to come, but he's staying. He's going to stay back and make sure all the shows get done as well. And so we've done some pre-shows but, too to get ready. And we've done some pre-shows to get ready, so you guys can still get a lot of information. We continue doing shows. And by the way, maybe I don't want to put put Don in, in, in under too much stress, but if you want to get in that last chance, just go to Blessed Hope Chapel. I'll leave a link in the description. I'll have them edit the description, so I'll have a link on there, and you guys can check it out and maybe see if you can sign up and still get in there. We'd love to meet you if you're on the East Coast. If you're if you're you know in your shot away, we'd love to meet you guys. We're going to be in Massachusetts. We'd love to have you guys it's about there. About being a man of God and, and and also understanding the times. And and I totally want to. I'm just it's just some exciting news. One of the things that we're doing here, guys. Literally, when we finish this live broadcast. We're gonna turn it off, we're gonna turn off the cameras, and we will be taking down this studio. This is a studio that, praise God, a lot of prayer went into it, and during COVID, we got to put a ton in, ton of work in. I probably shouldn't have said that, it's gonna bring our views down. But during that whole, uh, th those shenanigans, we got to put together this studio. Um, we, we went and picked this stuff out. We built it with our own hands here. Everything you see here has been built with people that are go to Blessed Hope Chapel, that are part of the church. But it's coming down. We're getting a new studio set built, a new desk, and everything. So keep that guy, keep that in prayer, prayer, guys. It's it's a lot of work, but it's going to be a blessing. Um, actually, right outside the studio, right now, the guy building the set is building it and waiting for us to finish this. <laughs> so I wanted to hand that off because we do need to answer the question in about two minutes, Joe. Okay. And I, I wanted I to give because that's some exciting stuff. And, and I want to, I thank you guys because of your support because of Patreon. Uh, dot com because you guys are on patreon.com those who support that's why we're Praise able God. to, we to redo we're this so grateful for the help that's why tommy can be on full-time and josh on full-time and still to, and, and why we still can do Tony so much that we do so we're very grateful exactly and so we're excited and it, it, it's not just something we put off on the side we want you to know how much you guys are a blessing to us and it literally is for the furtherment of the gospel so we furthering Amen. of the gospel so that we could preach as much as possible so joe with all that i'm still gonna take two minutes by the way bro. summarize i know you will i know you will <laughs> Summarize, uh, I why guess. Why it's important? Why it's important? And, and, I mean, if you wanted to answer the hard positive thing, maybe just give some caveat there, you know, uh, or, or whatever it may be. But why is this topic important? Why don't we just say, oh, whatever? I'm pan trib. As long as it pans out, everything's fine. And you guys shouldn't cause any division here, and we should never talk about this. 
Keep a lid on it and don't talk about it. Why should okay, we do that? Okay, so you threw the Arpazo thing in there. So and I know go a couple, couple okay. minutes after because we'll still be yeah. done within an hour because we started, like you said, a little bit late. So I should answer the Arpazo. Some That's of right. our pre-trib brothers and sisters say, hey, when Jesus comes, it says we'll meet him in the air. And they have Jesus being like a yo-yo. He comes down and it's midway in the air, then he goes back up. Why does he even have to come down at all then? Why didn't he just bring us up to heaven, right? Well, the scripture, when it uses the word meet, that we'll meet him in the air, that, that specific word is used in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, specifically 25, in the Olivet Discourse, when the, bride, the, the, the bridesmaids go out and meet Jesus on his way to the wedding. So, and it's used in classical Greek. It's used in the, it's in the, it's in the, it's used in the Greek of that day over and over again of going out to meet a dignitary or a king and his entourage while they come into a town. So when we meet him in the air, we come back with him. We meet him in the air because we're going to be transformed, get our new bodies, amen? And then we'll come with him as he dens, descends to the Mount of Olives and he will, and we'll reign with him for a thousand years. It's beautiful. So uh, it makes perfect sense that we go out and meet him because that was the picture that was being used and that God in his providence used in history to show what his coming would be like. And often they would greet the, the one who was coming and, and, and uh, there would be all kinds of things that took place, like blast of a trumpet, everything else as the king came. When it, when, and the word parousia, by the way, is used with kings coming. And those in the city going out to meet him and then coming back with him and bring him back. We'll be coming back with Jesus. That's the second coming of Christ. And by the way, I'll just cover this really quickly because I see that i got a few more minutes left because we said we've got till 6.05, but I'll try to do this by 6.03, 6.04 just in case, is her, uh, as far as many pre-tribs will say, well, they're different because the rapture is... Is he is he comes for the saints, and the the post trib coming, the second coming is different because he comes with the saints, and they try to make distinctions without a real difference. And what do I mean by that? Guess what? In First Thessalonians chapter four, he comes with and for the saints at the same coming. It says he brings with him the dead who are in Christ. Amen. As he comes for us. It's the same coming. So there's an artificial distinction being made, trying to get people to believe that there's two separate comings. The church never had believed that. So I encourage you not to believe it either. Why is it important? I think the best way to explain it, if I just have a few minutes, because there's a lot of different ways to explain the importance, but especially because Jesus said, I'm telling you these things ahead of time so you won't fall away regarding coming persecution. In other words, if he doesn't tell us ahead of time, we will fall away. And that was in John chapter 16, the first few verses there, that they're going to put you to death thinking they're doing God's service. And in Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25, Jesus said, False Christ and false prophets will arise, showing great signs and wonders, deceiving, if possible, the very elect. They're going to try to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And they said, Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I've warned you in advance. In other words, those warnings are given so we have a heads up so we're not deceived. If you take those warnings away, we're more likely to be deceived, we're more likely to fall, and guess what happens? Right at the beginning of the tribulation, when everybody thinks they're going to get raptured, a lot of the pre-tribbers, it says many will fall away just on time, just what Jesus was concerned about because people are hiding the warnings that Jesus gave the church. And they're being told, oh, don't worry. The Jew, the, the tribulation is for the Jews and that's when God wants to punish the Jews again. And 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 as for the 140,000, they're going to finish preaching the gospel. And the preterists say, oh, don't worry, don't have to go through the tribulation. The preterists, not pre but preterists. These are a lot of the Reformed people and not just for Reformed people, it's spreading throughout the church. The tribulation already happened except just before 70 AD and Nero was the Antichrist. These are all lies that keep you ill-equipped to persevere, persevere during that time. Think about this. What if you had the, your big, you're, you're majoring in some subject and the final's coming up? And it's a big deal, man. You've got to pass that final, man, to get your grade and to graduate, right? To get your, your degree. And guess what? You're told by students, you're getting letters and stuff. Hey, don't worry. The, the final's only for the Jews. We don't have to take the final. The, the teacher let us know, you know, different teachers are telling us that final's not for you guys. It's just for the Jews. And guess what? There's 144,000 people in the class that will take the final for you. Don't worry about it. They'll take it for you. And others are calling you saying, don't worry. The final already happened at the beginning of the, beginning of the, the year. It already happened. You know, a, a teacher named Nero gave the final. You just, you just missed it, you know. And then all of a sudden you're like getting convinced, man, I don't have to go. I don't have to be ready for the final. Then you show up at school and you're told it's going to be a, very, a big vacation instead, a big party. You know, which pre-trips say it'll be a party in heaven at that time as we watch our brothers get slaughtered on the planet Earth. And then you show up and there's the final. How will you do during that final? You'll fall flat on your face, man. You'll fail. It's critical that you take the exam and you go by the teaching that Jesus gave us ahead of time so we could pass should that time take place in our lifetimes. 
And that's why we earnestly say, yes, there is a final. If it happens in our lifetime, you are going to be there and you better be ready. That means you better be in the book. You better be reading the book of Revelation. You better be reading Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, the book of Daniel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and 2, chapter 4 and 5, and on and on and on. Stay in the book, man. Stay in the word. And don't listen to these Johnny-come-lately people that are saying, this isn't for you. This is new teaching. Even John Walbert said it's a new light. No. Well, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's because it's not new. We love you guys. No, thank you guys, man. And you know what? Thank you for the comments. Uh, we had a, a poll up, Joe, just so you know. I wanted to make sure we got the numbers in. A number of people thing we asked, do you believe in a pre-trib rapture? 72% said no. So there were a ton of brothers and sisters on here that still believe in a pre-trib rapture, but yeah, they're on you. here. And hopefully you guys were encouraged. And think thank about you guys what for our monthly live stream. We still have two episodes a week for you guys. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you feel so led... Please come join us on our Patreon community as well, and you guys can continue to help us. God Amen. bless you guys. And we love you guys, and we'll see you here, there, or in the air. Praise God. Amen.